When Verdansk returns to Warzone in March 2025, it would have been five whole years since the release of Call of Duty Warzone. When Warzone released, half of the entire planet was sat indoors. We're talking about a period of time where the only way to interact with your friends was online. A world where Call of Duty's version of Resurgence and Rebirth Island didn't even exist when Warzone first came out. With the fifth year of Call of Duty Warzone on the horizon, I decided to take a look back at just how much Warzone has changed in four years. From a 150 player battle royale mode to a 100 player battle royale mode, a resurgence mode, a DMZ excursion at some point or another, so much has changed in Warzone that some of the stuff you're going to see in this video will genuinely surprise or shock you. We're talking about an era of Warzone where smoke grenades didn't really exist and nobody used them. Uh, an era when nobody even conceived of using a website to figure out loadouts. And something that I guess a lot of people forgot about. An era when Call of Duty didn't even have an anti-cheat. Warzone's anti-cheat only released in October 2021 under Call of Duty Vanguard. A full 19 months after the original release of Call of Duty Warzone. There are entire limited time modes that featured once in Call of Duty's history and never returned. Take for example Juggernaut Royale, a mode where random Juggernaut drops would fly throughout the entire map and come into play. That hasn't returned since Verdansk's first release in March 2020. So I wanted to take a look back in time at all of the individual eras of Warzone and just how much has changed since then. We're talking about entirely different worlds in a game that's had multiple different iterations from multiple different development studios. And the first place to start is day one, Verdansk 2020. This was the era where everything was brand new. The idea of the word meta didn't really even exist, and Warzone in just 24 hours amassed 6 million players. This was a number that would grow to 100 million downloads by the end of the year in just under 12 months. In the Verdansk 2020 era, Warzone had the entire world in a vice grip that was primarily stuck at home, especially in March of 2020 when things first began. To put it into context to just how long ago this was, Verdansk 2020 released before the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. And the early days of Warzone were honestly just good fun. We saw effectively the first emergences of a couple of metas, the MP5 and the M4, definitely took center stage early on. And then we saw an explosive meta for a while with people running around with RPGs and C4. But the idea of a game having a certain competitive edge to it basically didn't exist in Warzone. The idea of advanced movement didn't exist, the idea of various different types of metas and methodologies on how to win didn't exist. It was the early days of this game that were arguably some of the purest. And this was a period of time where Warzone actually invested in having a lot of fun with the game modes. We're talking about Zombie Royale and the Haunting event. We're talking about things like Juggernaut Royale. We're talking about things like Shotguns and Snipers. Warzone was fully invested in messing around with the game in fun and exciting ways, and generally didn't seem to care too much about competition. Towards the end era of the dance 2020, there were definitely some growing pains. Metas definitely did start to become more prevalent as people noticed weapons like the AMAX, and people did start to realize that Warzone was going to have an underlying problem by not having an anti-cheat. PlayStation players and Xbox players also suddenly realized that their brand new consoles wouldn't be capable of running Warzone any better because it wasn't developed for new generation consoles, leaving them stuck at ATFOV in a very cross-play competitive environment, where their PC counterparts were playing with higher frame rates and higher field of views. After six very content-packed seasons in the first year of Warzone, we transitioned over to Warzone's Cold War era at the end of 2020. Verdansk released in March 2020, and by later that year, we had a brand new Call of Duty. But this new Call of Duty didn't release with a new Royale. There were entire rumor mills that Blackout 2 had been developed by the developers over a Treyarch and very swiftly abandoned. And this created a number of rumors about new maps for Call of Duty Warzone that never really surfaced. The reality of the Black Ops Cold War era is that Call of Duty didn't expect Warzone to be this successful and didn't realize it was going to take them integrating the game every single year. This was the first adjustment period for this franchise and something that really took them by surprise. It's safe to say that Blackout 2 was in full development and did intend to release with Black Ops Cold War, 
But with over 100 million people downloading Call of Duty Warzone, there was simply no way that they were going to abandon such a strong brand and a game that had effectively solidified itself amongst people like Fortnite and PUBG. And whilst this might be funny to think about, especially in 2024 and 2025 when people are longing for Verdansk to return, by the end of the year, people were wondering when the new map for Call of Duty was actually going to release, and lots of people were bitterly disappointed that the new map that came with Black Ops Cold War was in fact just a reskinned version of Verdansk set in 1984. The Black Ops Cold War era for Call of Duty Warzone is one of the most up and down eras for the entire franchise. Verdansk gets nuked off the rip in a one-of-a-kind event that takes Call of Duty Warzone effectively offline. And this was a really exciting moment for the vast majority of players who wanted to witness their first in-game Warzone event, and it was pretty well received, with thousands upon thousands of people watching online. But coming to the realization that they were playing another version of Verdansk that wasn't radically different from the one they'd already played, some people started to lose interest fully aware of the fact that it could be potentially another year before they saw a new map for Call of Duty Warzone. So the Verdansk 84 era definitely had a bit of a rocky start. On top of Call of Duty not really planning for Warzone's long-term support, they also had to deal with the fact that Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War was based on an older version that was incompatible with Call of Duty Warzone. It was on an older Call of Duty version that wasn't the new IWA engine, which meant that every character skin, every weapon skin, and every major change that happened in Black Ops Cold War had to be recreated and reinvented from scratch in the IWA engine. This meant that some character skins looked different and probably effectively doubled development time throughout the entirety of this game's life cycle. And Warzone definitely suffered a period of time of bugginess as a result of this. And that wouldn't be the end of trouble for the Cold War era. There were three major incidents within the Cold War era that really defined how Call of Duty's identity began to change in terms of Warzone. The first was arguably the DMR meta, which was such a large meta that it had the world going crazy with athletes and superstars and even musicians calling on Call of Duty to change how this weapon worked whilst they grappled with the fact that they had two different game engines and couldn't necessarily deal with them efficiently. And it effectively meant that for the first time ever, Call of Duty fans were starting to focus on the things that were broken in the game, the metas that were broken, and how to potentially abuse them. And I would argue that the Cold War era DMR meta was arguably the first time the idea of metas or competition or people having competitive advantages over opponents began to slip into the Warzone conversation. We did start to see it with the AMAX towards the end of Verdansk, but with the DMR, this was, I feel, an industry-defining moment for Call of Duty Warzone, and something that people really underlook. For the first time, even casual Joes sat at home were starting to wonder why their guns weren't performing better than other people's, and how that they could change that. And the ultra-specific loadout meta that we know today, with various metas being found every single update, with every single change tracked and traced, definitely stems from the Cold War era of Warzone. The second major thing is that skill-based matchmaking started to become on the radar for even casual conversations within Warzone, with players starting to wonder how matchmaking was working within the scene and why it appeared that some people had easier games than others, especially in the space for content creation and streaming. Now, whilst I'm not accusing anybody here, there's no denying that there were some content creators during this era who had definitely figured out the formula before others. The discovery and conversation surrounding skill-based matchmaking meant that people were actively starting to track their lobbies, with the introduction in the Cold War era towards the Vanguard era of SPMM tracking websites, people figuring out how hard the lobbies they were were in, and also statistics being used to identify how Call of Duty's matchmaking system worked. All of this would be swiftly taken offline by Call of Duty in the not-too-distant future, who to this day are still not particularly keen on talking about how Warzone's matchmaking system works. But it did become particularly clear that even to casual audiences who weren't necessarily hyper-involved with gaming, that skill-based matchmaking was a conversation that was being had, and players felt that they were being a little bit confused or cheated by how the Call of Duty system worked. And the third biggest conversation, which definitely linked into the Call of Duty SPMM conversation, was that cheating started to become an epidemic on the main stage for Warzone. 
Whilst it was definitely something that existed before, as players progressively fell off of the game and didn't use it as much in their regular rotation as new titles released, a more condensed matchmaking pool with more skill-based matchmaking meant that cheaters were starting to permeate a lot of lobbies and were starting to get real visibility amongst content creators and professional players who explained that this game didn't have an anti-cheat. And once it was clear that Warzone didn't have an anti-cheat, it was effectively the Wild West until they did develop one at a later date. The only way that you could avoid cheaters during the Cold War and Verdansk eras of Warzone was literally to block them. Reporting them effectively led to nothing, and manual ban waves only got a small number of cheaters in comparison to the numbers that were used. But the Cold War era wasn't necessarily a complete failure, and in fact, it had a lot of success too. The Cold War era actually introduced some well-loved changes to Verdansk like opening up the stadium, and definitely introduced arguably the biggest thing in Call of Duty's history for Warzone, which is Resurgence. People don't realize that Call of Duty's Resurgence system only released in December of 2020. The return of Rebirth Island was something that wasn't there from launch. Many people make the mistake of thinking that Call of Duty has always had Resurgence, but in reality, it was something that was introduced into the game's first year of its life cycle. Resurgence as a mode is so popular now that it arguably probably does dwarf the big map content ecosystem, and you can see that from the most recent year of Call of Duty Warzone. Casual players definitely lean towards the respawn modes, and it's safe to say that the introduction of something like Resurgence ended up completely reshaping the landscape not only for big map, but also in terms of the mechanics available to it. Ultimately, Call of Duty secretly discovered a very key feature, that casual players who just wanted a bit of fun really liked the idea of respawning. The Cold War era also had a lot of fun with things like weapon skins and master cross bundles, and also changing things like having red door systems and easter eggs within Warzone and was definitely an era of Warzone that to this day is still remembered quite fondly, despite its ups and downs. It only took until Vanguard in the release of October 2021 to winter of 2021, and this new era of Warzone, that Call of Duty arguably got its hardest cold shoulder. After player fatigue effectively took over during the Cold War era, and people started to wonder about certain parts of the game not working the way they thought it would, or just generally feeling a little bit frustrating, the Vanguard era was definitely the least popular era of Warzone. The Caldera map itself had a very cold reception, with lots of open spaces, greenery that made visibility miserable, and generally something that was really hard for console players to enjoy, just down to the visuals alone. This entire era was basically marred by a map that felt incompatible with Warzone. Most people definitely wanted to see a new map for Call of Duty Warzone, and definitely were looking to see the end of the Verdansk era, nobody was expecting a wide open green space to be the replacement for a beloved urban environment. And despite Call of Duty Vanguard reintroducing the main multiplayer title to the IWA engine, and therefore making Warzone development easier, World War II weapons were generally quite unpopular, planes and bombers were unpopular, and the Caldera map I think is arguably remembered as the least popular big map appearance in all of Warzone. The Caldera era wasn't entirely terrible, and definitely tried to do some unique and interesting things with limited time events and a Godzilla vs King Kong event that arguably maybe wasn't the most fondly remembered. But it did also mark the release of the anti-cheat for Call of Duty Warzone, which by the release in 2021 was desperately required. The cheating conversation and situation with Warzone had genuinely gotten so bad that I genuinely do not blame people for giving up playing Warzone. I mean, we were talking about cheaters that were so prevalent and so problematic that entire swathes of players basically just felt like winning a game of Warzone would forever be beyond them. The one thing I definitely will always appreciate about the Vanguard era of Warzone is that in June 2022, it did give us the release of Fortune's Keep, which to this day, in my view, is still the best resurgence map we've ever had and still the best designed resurgence map we've ever had. And whilst it didn't have the longest shelf life in the world, Fortune's Keep, to me, was a really nice escape from Caldera. I would say within the era of Caldera and within the Vanguard era, generally speaking, Call of Duty Warzone plateaued. It didn't really have new content that brought people into the game, and it ultimately felt very stale and different from what people remembered and enjoyed from the earlier iterations of the game. And the Caldera era, arguably in my view, is the first decline of Warzone. So it's no surprise that in November 2022, the Modern Warfare 2 era began and our Mazra released. A map that, to this day, I don't think has been topped. I genuinely think our Mazra is the best map we've seen in Call of Duty Warzone for Big Map, and although the mechanics were fundamentally different, 
I would love to see it return to the franchise. But November 2022 was effectively the great reset for Call of Duty Warzone. I mean, we're talking about a game that went from fast paced and fluid gameplay through all of the previous versions and iterations to a game that effectively resembled a hybrid milsim mode that just felt like it wasn't Warzone at all. The Modern Warfare 2 era completely changed how Warzone worked. We're talking about radical changes, no loadout drops to be seen for entire swathes and segments of the map. We're talking about looting systems that introduced backpacks that felt more like the DMZ extraction mode and less like a fast paced battle royale. And we're talking about a game that just didn't really feel like Warzone. An era for Warzone that's so different from everything that came from before, the floating loot disappeared. Interacting with a loot crate meant that you brought up a miniature menu. An era where effectively every single building in the entire map featured artificial intelligence that wanted to shoot you and completely ruined the flow and gameplay of how Call of Duty worked. The introduction of things like black sites and strongholds that felt almost incompatible with the overall design of Warzone and slower gameplay that just felt like we were playing Warzone with bricks on our feet. And the world really did respond to this. It's no surprise that from the release of November 2022 for our Mazra, the interest in search results for Call of Duty Warzone plummeted to the lowest level it's ever seen before. The slower paced gameplay didn't work out, the AI gameplay didn't work out, and it felt like fans, YouTubers, and the general audience for Warzone were trying to get their version of Warzone back from Infinity Ward who were unwilling to change. And it doesn't help that they left things like a broken Vector and RPK meta in the game for as long as humanly possible. By the summer the following year, Modern Warfare 2 had tried to undo a fair number of the changes it had already made because of the fact that it was losing players at an alarming rate, and had a little bit of a resurgence with Modern Warfare 2's big map ranked in summer, which definitely went down a lot more successfully than I think Call of Duty give it credit for. I genuinely think that if big map rank didn't release that summer, you probably would have seen the end of interest in Warzone from content creators and streamers at that very moment. They also brought us Ashika Island in this era, which was also quite deeply unpopular, and generally speaking, Modern Warfare 2's version of Warzone, and arguably Infinity Ward's baby returning to them, was the least popular era Call of Duty has had so far. And this all leads to the Warzone that we have today. I mean, it really does go to show just how much has changed. Redeploy balloons didn't exist. Redeploy packs and flares didn't exist. Portable buy stations weren't a thing. There was a period of time where stopping power doubled the power of any gun and was completely broken. Gas mechanics didn't exist beyond a gas mask, there was no portable decontamination stations, there were no perks that interacted with the gas system. Airstrikes used to go through entire buildings and kill people even though they were inside a building. Perk packages completely were introduced into the game as lootable items that weren't previously lootable before. The looting system went from not having a backpack to having a backpack to having the backpack removed in Black Ops 6's era which is upcoming. Floating loot has never made a return to Warzone, for reasons that I don't think anybody quite understands. Loadouts completely disappeared and then were reintroduced in the Modern Warfare 2 era, and for those of you who don't remember, when Almaz were released, there were AI in every single building. I'm not even kidding. This, this is something that people have completely forgotten about. There were AI in nearly every single building in Warzone. The errors of Warzone that I've completely described to you here are so different from one another, and it's going to change again in Black Ops 6 with the introduction of a new movement system that will fundamentally change how Warzone works again. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video, and if you have, drop a like, drop a sub, and I'll see you in the next one.